Reed Coolset, welcome to the Single Track Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Finn. One thing I want to say before we get into it, um, I'm a huge fan of our sport, and I get really excited talking with folks like you because uh, you have a high caliber road running background, and you bring a certain professional pedigree to our sport. And now you're here, and I feel like athletes like yourself uh, just continually raise the bar. So. Um, I think we'll talk a bit about why you decided to get into the trail scene and we'll cover your background on the roads, but, uh, just wanted to say that before we get started, this is a really exciting time to be in ultra running. And I feel like folks like you entering it is just further proof. Cool. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm super excited to, to, you know, just do more races and figure out how to, how to, how to do this whole ultra thing. And it's, it's so exciting for me and I've, I've met a lot of great people along the way. So um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, right on. And just for context, like we were, we were talking before we hit record here and I had like a whole list of things I wanted to cover. And I think we added like five more bullet points to the list. So this is not just going to be a conversation about your entry into the sport. It's going to be a conversation about, uh, our state of the sport and things you're excited about, uh, interesting perspectives you have on our sport coming from a totally different area of running. So it's going to be great. Um, I do think that you are still relatively unknown in the trail running scene. So it's worth, uh, talking about your background. So, um, what's like an, give us like an elevator pitch on, on who you are and, and what you've done in running and yeah. Yeah. I, I started running pretty early, um, at, at a sports camp, we would run in the trails every day, um, at lunch, at lunch. That was like when I was seven and eight and, um, I liked it. I liked running the trails. So yeah, middle school started running cross country and track. And, um, I didn't really like track that much. I didn't run it in high school in the beginning. I would always run cross country like every single year. But then when track came around, the, the idea of just running in circles wasn't appealing. I would, uh, so I would just skateboard in the spring and in summer and then get back to cross country in the fall. And towards the, towards the very end of high school, um, started running track and, um, and then, uh, I, got good enough where it made sense to go to university and like, um, and, and run on the team there. Similar kind of thing, like start off university as the alternate on the cross country team. And by my fifth year of university, um, was meddling, um, and winning some Canadian university championships. Uh, so then the next, the next step was like kind of contemplating, do I, you know, do I invest in, in, and try to run, you know, quote unquote professionally, um, more, I wouldn't say professionally, but maybe full-time or maybe not even full-time, but anyways, I got a job working at a bank 25 hours a week. And that allowed me to still improve as a runner, but also just, you know, have food on the table and pay rent. Um, and that's when I actually made uh, my biggest improvements. So by the time 2004 came around, I surprised myself. Um, I didn't, I didn't have any ambition. Like I didn't really think I was going to make the Olympics in 04. Yeah. And then I had a big PB in the 5k ran 1331 and ended up being six seconds off the qualifying mark for the Olympics. Um, and looking back, like I was, I was not disappointed that I was that close and didn't make it. I was actually just thrilled that I got that close. That was, it was, um, we, it was, it was, I kind of surpassed my expectations. Um, funny enough, that was the same race that Galen Rupp, broke like the U S high school record and ran 1337. Yeah. So I was, I was in that race. Um, and that's that running 1331 in 2004, um, really was the, the catalyst to, to, to make this like, even like, even like double down and, and really go for it. So, um, uh, I made the world champs in 05 in the 5k. So I, I got my PB down to 1323. And at that point, um, quit my job because I was giving government funding and then just went full on to try to make the 2008 Olympics. So that's kind of how I got into, um, you know, kind of like grassroots, just love trail running to um, kind of obsessed with figuring out how fast I can get on the track. And how many Olympic Games did you participate in and what events were you running? Um, so I, yeah, 2008, uh, I was training in Flagstaff and slipped on ice and that whole season was a wash and never ran an outdoor track race. And then okay. 
moved to the marathon in 09 and then I made the Olympics in 2012 and 2016. So I ran the Olympics. Yeah. Those two years. Um, and then I went for one more, uh, last year, not even a year ago. Um, and, uh, had by that, by the, the Canadian team was pretty strong. So instead of just trying to get the minimum standard to 1130, which probably would have been the case in 2020, but by the time 2020 rolled, 2021 rolled around, yeah. uh, some of the younger guys got faster and I would have had to run under 210, 15. Okay. Uh, so I went for broke, um, and I was on pace through halfway, felt pretty good. And then, yeah, things fell apart. Um, and that was, yeah, that was my last marathon of uh, April, 2021. What's your, what's your marathon PR? Uh, two ten twenty eight. Okay. Is that, I'm at a loss here. Is that the fastest marathon time in the ultra, in the mountain ultra trail running scene? Do you know? You know what? I don't know. Um, but I remember when Nick Arciniaga yes. said he was going to start doing trail running. He was a two eleven guy and, um, people were like, oh, this is the fastest marathoner to jump into ultras. So, um, I don't Could know. Be. <laughs> oh, we almost got him in too. Uh, he, he used to be based here in Salt Lake city. He was working at Salt Lake running company. I think he started a, a shop down in Sedona, Arizona, and I don't know oh, cool. what he's been doing for training sense, but great guy. And another one that we almost, we almost recruited a couple of things I want to go back on. Um, we love talking like about how athletes attempt to make it as a professional in the sport. And you talked about the calculus that went into deciding whether you're going to be a full-time runner and you worked part-time at a bank for a bit. What is, what does it look like to be supported as, as, as a marathoner, especially in Canada? Like you mentioned the government funding as well. I know here in the U S if you're an Olympian, our government doesn't do a great job of support. You have to do a lot of like fundraising on the side. Were you in a position where you had, I'm not going to use the term luxury, but did you have the ability to solely focus on running and, and support was pretty good? Uh, yeah, I did. So yeah, in, tw- in 2005, like I said, um, stopped working at the bank because I, that's when I got government funding from my times in, uh, tw- 2004. Okay. So that's about, it was around just over 20 grand a year. That's tax free. So it's, it's a really good place to start if you're living not in a major city and yeah. you're in a house with three other runners paying rent kind of thing, you know, um, you, you can kind of make it work that in addition to, um, having a sponsor and some prize money. So, uh, I was sponsored in 05 by Reebok. They were pretty much just taking care of travel. Um, and no, there was no, no salary and prize money was pretty, it was is pretty slim in, in track and field. Like it's yeah. really hard to make money. Like, you know, I'd go to go to go to Belgium and run 1321 5k and uh and, and basically come out of that trip negative money. Like you I'm paying more money to fly and blah blah blah. Um so it was more of like actually the local races where you can pick up 500 bucks here and there. And like I did a you know a golden league 10k like in, in Brussels. Um and made 500 bucks, you know, like it was, it was really tough. And, um, yeah, r- moving to the road. So I moved to the roads in 09 and all of a sudden I realized there's just way more people paying attention. Right. So my first marathon was 217. Um, I didn't really think it was that great, but I got way more attention than the year before, like, you know, a couple of years before running under 28 minutes for 10 K. Okay. Um, you know, like, you run 27 something and it's like no one really, it didn't really seem like that many people cared. And then 217 people like, Oh my goodness. You know? And uh, I'm like, but I've, I've run way better than this, but that translated to um, sponsors stepping up. So at that point I was sponsored by new balance and qualifying for the Olympics. Basically I went from just getting a small stipend to a, like, like a, a bit of a salary. So between, appearance money for road races and prize money. Um, that was kind of like a third of my salary. My government carding was like a third of my salary. And then new balance was like a third of my salary. And at that point I felt as though, um, I was making enough money to actually, you know, call myself professional and, and, and do exactly what I wanted to do, go on training camps and, you know, just kind of live this, which I'm trying to change now, but like, you know, the, you basically do your training, 
do your core and then rest, you know, like yeah. just, you know, like really rest up. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, uh, because our sport trail running is not at a point yet where a critical mass of athletes have the opportunities to go full time. Like they're all, most sponsored athletes have like stipend based contracts and they definitely have to work other gigs to, to make ends meet. But I'm also surprised when I ask them, you know, if you had the opportunity, would you do this full time? The vast majority of them say no for various reasons, but they say no. And I'm curious if you can talk about what your lifestyle was like, maybe in the early 2010s, uh, when you were being fully supported. Yeah. If you could like walk us through like what a day looked like. And then I'm curious if you, if you liked that lifestyle, if it was something that you think you benefited from. Yeah. And, and that's a really good question. And I think I did benefit from it. Um, you have to have a certain personality, um, to make it work. Um, you, it's almost like you end up putting a lot more pressure on yourself when you're not well-rounded. Um, and I would, I was always encouraging, um, kind of the up and comers to, you know, do a master's, um, or, you know, like, or do something they're interested in. So, like, you know, if to work 40 hours a week, um, would, is it as if, as a marathoner trying to make the Olympics is really tough. Yeah. Working 20 hours a week is like perfect. I think, um, mm. something like that, or, or doing a mass or something where there's, um, you know, where, where, you, where if you get injured, like, you know, you get injured or things aren't going well with running. It doesn't feel like you've just, you're wasting time or like you have optionality. You know, you, yeah. You start feeling stressed that things aren't working out. Um, so yeah, I would just wake up in the morning and take my time, you know, have whatever, like, you know, have my breakfast, meet, meet, we would meet our group would meet at usually like 9am our marathon training group. So Eric Gillis was my main training partner. Um, he finished 10th at the 2016 Olympics. So we were like pretty much just neck and neck, um, being able to push each other in workouts. And then we had a few other guys that actually worked um, pretty much full time that would, would meet with us too. Um, okay. Rob Watson for a while was kind of a full, he was a full-time athlete right in the mix as well. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of felt sorry, like these other guys, you know, they would do the same workout as us and then go, you know, they're a chiropractor or, you know, they're, they're building houses and, yeah. you know, shoe rep for Nike or whatever. And, you know, Eric and I are like, all right, uh, yeah, time, time, his nap time now. And it's <laughs> like, you know, whatever, like, and then do, you know, do some core, do your second run. And yeah, it, it was, all, it was just all um, it just evolved around training. And I, I lived with um, another Olympian, Taylor Milne, similar sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, Chris Winters, they, 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 like other Olympians were kind of like in this house that was sponsored by our club and new balance. So we didn't pay rent. Um, yeah. It was just like easy living. And um, but a lot of people would crumble under that pressure of I'm everything I'm doing is running. And if it's, if it doesn't go well, then I have nothing to show for it. So yeah, I, I, I would say, yeah, it's not, it's not the route for everyone. And just looking back for your, for your caliber of athlete, the guys that were, you know, hoping to get into the Olympics, did you notice performance differences between the runners that were doing this full time and the runners that had to balance it with a side gig or was it all over the place? Well, it was a bit all over the place, but at the same time to be able to do it full time, you had to reach a certain level, um, you know, to, to make it like, you're not going to run, you're not going to just go run 220 for the marathon and be like, well, oh, I'm just going to do this full time and take 10 minutes off my time. You know, you're like, you, you kind of get down, 215, 214, 230, you know, and, and I did that. I did have a track before I moved to the marathon. So mm -hmm. when I was running 1340s, I had, I, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't thinking I would do, do, like I would run full time. It wasn't until I ran, um, well, really like, well, 30, yeah, 1331 and 04, which, which I actually still was still working 25 hours a week when I did that. But yeah. when it came time to go to Europe the next summer, I wanted to take two months off. It, at that point, it just made sense to, to not work. And, and then, yeah, I, I, and then I, yeah, I ran 1323. And at that point it was like, okay, I'm not going to go back to work. I was, I wasn't sure what I was going to do after the summer, but running 1323 helped help me justify 
justified. So I, yeah, you got to get to a, you can't just say, Oh, full-time runners are, are better. It's like, you got to be good to become a full-time runner. Really? Yeah. That's a great point. Um, yeah, because I, we're at a point in trail running where I'm guessing that about 5% of the sponsored athletes have the resources to do it full time. But I have this belief that once that number reaches, once it goes over 50%, I think that that's going to be like a point of no return. And anybody that's a sponsored athlete is going to have to do whatever it takes to get to a full time status because they're not going to be able to compete with people that don't just run once or twice a day, but also have that time in between to recover and to do all of the ancillary stuff, like going to a Cairo, going to a sports psychologist, maybe going to the gym to lift weights. I just think that if there's enough people doing this, you know, day in, day out, um, it's going to be yeah. a competitive advantage. I, I would think there, I would 90% agree with that. I think yeah. that will be the thing, but I don't think I, 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 I would would I, I i can't see it being 100 percent true okay. you know I, I would i would say yes that's going to help most athletes but you're going to have an athlete who who works um you know even a manual job mm. come out to an ultra and it be i mean training for the marathon i used to think mar- people who train for the marathon like i would dissect the differences of what some one person's doing and another person like wow it's so different right and now that I'm training for the ultras, I'm like, wow, it's pretty homogenous marathon training. Like, like I would be like, oh, that person's running, you know, 150 K a week. And that person's running 220 and like, uh, and, but like most of the workouts are structured in very similar ways. There's, there's not that many different ways to train for the marathon compared to what I now see in the ultra where, you know, some, some people might like, you know, schema and bike a ton and run a little bit, or, um, I was lis- just listening to Jeff Colt you know, talk yeah. about just being on your feet. And like, so there's, there's, you know, when you go, when you go and run ultras, like as I'm finding out, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, my fitness isn't what, what's holding me back when I get to 50, 60 K into the race. Right. So there's, there's just the durability, um, issue and, um, tough legs. I, yeah. And I, I think if you're a pampered athlete, you could very well, miss some of that so you can incorporate it with with a job or or doing other things and th- that will help you with ultras that's a fantastic point i actually so i bookmarked that i i want to talk maybe later in the conversation about how you are a student of the sport because that point you made about noticing homogenous training styles and ultras is pretty fascinating um i do want to talk right now though about uh what made you first interested in trail and ultra running so yeah. What was your, how did you first like get interested in this scene? Yeah. So I've, like I said before, I was a kid, I loved cross country and hated track. So, um, running the trails appealed to me, uh, when, I, before, yeah, when I was in university, I worked at a running store and I worked with these two guys, um, Ryan and, uh, and Clark okay. and, um, yeah, Ryan Melcher and Clark Zealand, and they ran JFK like every single year. And, when I would work at the store with them, all they would talk about is like JFK and Western States. <laughs> and, uh, and Clark was good. He, I, I think he finished top three, um, at, at Western States, um, probably around, you know, 2000, 2001, somewhere around there, definitely top five, a couple of times, Ryan finished, uh, if he finished in the top 10, a couple of times, I think he finished like ninth as a 19 year old. Um, so, you know, this is 20 years ago. But uh, they would always talk to me about, oh, you got to do West, you know, sorry, you got to do JFK, you got to do JFK. And um, I was intrigued then. Um, and th- but then, yeah, in 2003, um, I just made a pretty good jump in the 5K. And I was just like obsessed with, you know, trying to get to, you know, the next level in the 5K. Um, and, then, and then missing the Olympics in 08, it was like, we started with the marathon. And then we became obsessed with the marathon. I'm like, okay, let's try to get to the Olympics. And I, and I got there. And then, after that, it was like, um, it was still improving at the marathon. Um, and the, and the, then there's the 2016 Olympics and like, you know, that those were really exciting times. And that was, I didn't want to like, um, I didn't want to, I was just so focused on that. Um, and then in 2017, I had an injury that took me out for six months and I didn't think, uh, I didn't think I could just jump back in and have a good marathon. 
So I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to get my feet wet in ultras, do some like longer stuff, take my time to get my fitness back. And then, and then after a year, decide if, what I want to do. Um, but as 2018 rolled around, I was still, it was still my, in my, like how I was making my income yeah. and Boston marathon offered me a pretty good appearance fee. I hadn't done Boston yet. And I didn't really know how to navigate ultra world and especially like how I could make money there. Um, and the appeal to Boston. So I just, yeah, I ran Boston and I finished ninth and, and then I started thinking, Oh, wow, you can start qualifying for the Olympics in like eight months. I've come this far. Let's try to go for one more Olympics. Uh, then the pandemic happens and I'm running marathons for another year. So in, I think 2018, 2019, I had this idea that I would go for the 2020 Olympics, whether I make it or not, I do JFK in 2020. Mm. Um, the pandemic happened. I, I decided let's go for the Olympics, whether I make it a lot, whether I make it or not, JFK 2021. Um, so I, I ran the, the, uh, the marathon in Italy in 2021 in April, came back and messaged my buddy. It was like, Hey, how's that, how's that ultra you're training for at the end of June? And it was QMT. Uh, and he, he said, actually it got postponed to mid August. And I started thinking like, Oh, mid August, I can be ready for that. And I was like, Oh man, I'm going to sign up too. Like we'll train together for it. And then he said, um, he's a good buddy, Jordan, uh, and Jordan, he said that, he can't make the new August date um, that he's going to sell his bib. And I was going to do the 80 K at QMT and he was signed up for the 110. Um, and there was a wait list to get in to the, to the, to the race at this point. So he just, we just trained, I just bought his bib off of him. And all of a sudden I was entered into a 110 K event. And my, my goal or my plan at that point was still QMT in August and then JFK. Um, in, in November. Um, but then I won QMT, which, um, uh, I won, uh, airfare and accommodations and race entry to any of the grand raid races. Um, so I just, I couldn't pass that up. And all of a sudden I was doing another technical trail race and didn't do uh, JFK. So that's, that's kind of how I didn't get into it for a long time. And then finally went head first. Well, oh. maybe the next question is what is exciting you most about our sport? right now? Oh, uh, I mean, there's, for me, there's just so much exciting because I'm learning like so much every week about it, learning new names and new races. Um, like so many of these races that, um, I, I, I had no clue that existed. Um, and I want to do, um, just stuff like Sierras and all just looks like such a cool race, but I mean, I won't do that. It doesn't really fit in my schedule. Um, so yeah, just really, it's just, I mean, there's just so much, I don't even know where to begin, but, um, I, I do like, you know, like I'll look at what I don't know, these races that are coming up. Like there's a Moab race and Chuck and Nut and just seeing how like those play out. It's, um, that's exciting. I think what was really exciting was the coverage that era Viper did at black canyons. Um, I think that's going to be a game changer. Um, a lot of people, after the race we're like man like you know i kind of tuned I, I like you know i turned it on and thought i would just kind of tune in for a bit and they they kind of had it on all day you know they maybe go for a run come back check it out and um the you know the drone shots worked really well and you know i think there's still a lot that they can do there um but they're ahead of the game and the, the i think that's going to really help um people be able to, to follow the sport um in a way they can consume it one thing, and I'm thinking about the Black Canyon live coverage, I was in the same situation. I was tuned in for the whole race and it was great to have as like a, like a, like background commentary while I was working on my computer, doing other things. One idea that I had for it in the moment was um, pulling in content, like athlete supported, athlete contributed, or people around the athlete contributed content to the race. Like if you could get footage of certain athletes like that were in the top 25 or in contention for the golden tickets to submit content from their training, maybe interviews, maybe like shots of them doing hill repeats on their local mountain or something like that. It'd be cool to break up the, the coverage with some of that stuff, like, like the breakaway stuff that you sometimes see in like golf and football and stuff. So 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at like what Tour de France does, right? They 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 do that. They do that kind of stuff during the race yeah. too. Yeah, you yeah. know, kind of gives the uh, the announcers a fifteen minute breather, and then you get to know the athletes a little more and just splice it in. Um, yeah, I think that would be great. Um, yeah, get to know some of the athletes and or even even some of the behind the the scene stuff on what the course is like. You could, um, yeah, but yeah, lots of potential there. But definitely like really cool to see um someone taking it by the helm and 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 leading the charge one thing i'm curious about given that you're new to the sport you have a perspective that i don't have because i've been indoctrinated by you know the i run fars of the world for the last six years and i have a certain bias towards how i consume information how do you follow the sport and, and do you have any uh are you noticing things you like about how the sport is covered and things you'd like to see improved Oh yeah. Good question. Um, yeah, so much is new to me. Like I didn't even know what ultra sign up was, um, until like, um, after I ran my first ultra, like, cause they didn't use ultra sign up QMT mm. and someone's like, I was like, Oh, I was like, yeah, that was a great, I'm like that first ultra was awesome. And then someone's like, Oh, you're going to be on ultra sign up. And I was like, what is this? You know, <laughs> like, um, I run far, they were covering Western States a couple of years ago. So I started following them on tw Twitter. Yeah. And that's when I first kind of discovered I run far and yeah. yeah, yeah. And then now like, I'm, I'm like going through old articles and like, I'm reading interviews from like John O'Wyatt from like 2012 and stuff like, like just going way back um, and, and uh, ultra running mag. Yeah. I, I think like, you know, just listening to pot, I mean, podcasts have been, um, been really good for me. Um, I've always, I've been listening before I got into ultra podcast, I was listening to Mario Fraioli's um, shake out. And, yeah. And that like, he, he would have ultra people on every once in a while anyways. And so I would, when I first started getting ultra, I would, I would go back and especially listen to people like Magda Boulay who made a transition yeah. from roads to, yeah. so listening to her podcast on Mario uh, Mario's was, was great. Um, yeah. Anthony Castalis um, who I, Got to, you know, I got to run with a bit at Black Canyons, listen to a couple of his podcasts, knowing that he, you know, he'd run a fast um, marathon. He's run 213 and him trying to like realize that, you know, hiking is actually part of the sport, even though it doesn't feel like training. So some of the same sort of hiccups that, that I had um, uh, in trying to figure out how to, you know, quote unquote, get ultra legs. Right. Well, you made a really interesting point uh, just before we hit record about how, when you think about this sport of mountain ultra trail running and maybe also the road scene, although I'm less familiar, you made a great point that it's difficult to think of this sport and to follow it in terms of seasons, like major league baseball, national football league, national basketball association. They have these very clear cut six to nine month seasons, and there's a well-defined off season. What are your thoughts there about maybe what ultra running could do to be more logical when it comes to like a set in stone type season for athletes to organize around? I think for the long events, um, I don't even know if you'd want to do that because, um, you know, you, 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 like you can't same with marathoning, right. You can't just go and do them like every week, like other sports. So, you know, if, if there's an important, if there's a really important race that a lot of people are doing, like in, in June, like you don't want to have one like a week before or a week after. So, you know, if, like I, like, like, I didn't really know that much about, um, you know, the, the Cape town ultra until my buddy Jordan ran it a couple yeah. of years ago, but that being in December is like, it's great for that race because you know, what else are you paying to, attention to in December and like Bandera in, in January, like that they're able to, cause it's in Texas. You can, you can kind of host it. So, um, I think it's really cool. You always, you can always have these races to, you know, even if you're not doing them, um, you know, like pay attention to, and, and for a runner, one thing that sucked about track is like, especially if you're running the European, you know, like I'd go to Europe and run track. And, um, in 2006, I got, um, I got bronchitis and so pretty much missed the, the European track season. And I like the very end kind of went and tried to get a couple races under my belt just to qualify for the government funding. But if you get injured at the wrong time mm. in track, like that's it. Whereas with marathoning, I remember like I, 
I, I flew off my mountain bike and broke my collarbone in 2013. I was slated to run the Toronto marathon. And then I was like, well, I'm not going to run for six weeks. Um, what, you know, is there a marathon six, seven weeks later? Yeah, sure. There's the Fukuoka marathon. So I ended up, I ended up going there and running. So, you know, it, it is like, you can kind of like recover and have your training blocks when you need them. And I think that's really cool about what ultra provides. So I, I wouldn't want to see a season. Very cool. Well, just for the sake of interesting banter, I'll take a slightly opposite take. Um, but I do agree with all of that. <laughs> I think, I think I'm incredibly biased by the fact that like, I love the NHL and I love the NBA and I'm a huge fan of those leagues. And because they have, you know, a regular season and a playoffs and an off season and like a trade deadline. And there's speculation about, you know, which athlete will get traded or become a free agent. Um, it just makes for these like interesting blocks of time that create specific purposes and interesting storylines and things to talk about. And in my opinion, that's what is part of the solution to uh, creating more fans around the sports. I feel like ultra running and road running and track there's been like a, a problem in terms of creating fans over the last couple of decades. And maybe this is one of the ways we can, we can, we can bring spect more spectators into the sport. Yeah, that makes sense. And like the golden trail series, I think does something like that in the sense that you have all these lead up races and then you have like the grand finale kind of thing. Right. So you can follow that along and, and see the rankings. I would say one thing that I'm still kind of out on the loop on, and it's one of those things where people who follow ultras probably like know it real well, but yeah. to me, I don't know, really know what the world championship deal is in ultra. Like there's, cause there's like, there's road ones, there's trail ones, there's short, there's long. I, 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 I might, and I might be wrong on this cause I'm just, I haven't been in the sport long enough, but I think it would be, and I don't even know if this is possible, but I, I would like to see um, the, the biggest races kind of host like the, the world champs, just, just being on courses that people know, whether it's like, you know, UTMB is going to be uh, like, you know, the CCC is going to be the whatever hundred K how many is that CC hundred K is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Still learning, but like, it's a, like, you know, a race everyone knows yeah. would be the world champs. Yeah. And then you, you'd have extra spots for countries to, you know, they could, could submit entries instead of having like a one-off because who's going to, I don't know. And I might be wrong. Cause I don't know, but like if they have a hundred K world champs in uh, say September, October, um, and you and you can run ccc or that it's like you have to make this decision because ccc is probably a better race it's probably a bigger race you probably your sponsors are probably going to like it more yeah. so i don't know like you can't do, it's hard to do both i know some ultra runners do a ton but you know it's hard so i don't know i, I would i would it'd be just cool if it was like you, you see both of them at once we we definitely without question have a legitimacy problem in our sport like there's at least three organizations off the top of my head that are positioning themselves as the de facto championship for each distance. Like the UTMB world series is trying to do it. Spartans trying to do it. Um, those are just, just to name a few. Um, and I mean, I consider myself a super fan of the sport and I still couldn't tell you like who the governing bodies really are in our sport and like what ITRA really does and you know, what the world mountain running championships really are like, um, it's, it's really muddled. I feel like we just had this massive revolution in our sport and like no clear leader came out on top to like set direction. It just feels like we're still in this like chaos rebuilding mode. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it seems like to me. So, <laughs> um, what, I know this is another area that I'd love to talk with you about. What is the perception of the trail and ultra running world, uh, among like road marathoners like yourself, like as you were talking with guys and girls in training and, and on the scene, did you get a sense of what they thought of our world? Yeah, I think, and there's, I think there's very different opinions. So similar to like how the rest of track views steeplechase, they think it's an easier event because when you see steeplechasers do other events, their times aren't on par, but it's like, but they're not those are their peak when, when they're peaking, they're running steeple. They're not they're, the 1500s and the 5Ks are their preseason stuff. And so you're, you know, you can't compare 
you know, if you took a 5k runner, you wouldn't ever just look at their preseason races and like judge them on that. Yeah. Um, and so in the same, in a similar vein, like trail running has its own, um, like, like, like it, it has a different skill set, right? There, it has its own skill set that is more than just um, becoming uh, fast over 42.2K. So when a trail runner goes and runs 42.2K, you know, and they've had success somewhere else, they're like, oh, so a, 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 two, a 220 guy or a two, you know, 232 woman can be at the top of the game. Like that's pretty far off. But I know if I train properly, for you know western states um i'm not gonna run my best marathon if i if i were to train properly for utmb i would it would be even more so that i'd be minutes 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 off of what i could do in the marathon and so some road runners i think have that misperception that like the training so similar that they should the you know these trail runners should be able to do a good half marathon and a good like that's like their peak mm. um I, I would think a lot of people give trail running a lot of respect, but at the same time, we, I don't like, I didn't know what trail running was until I thought I knew what it was until I went to QMT. Like I, when I was training for the marathon, 90%, 80% of my running was on the trails. Right. Mm. But I'm talking like groom trails where you don't even really have to look at your footing. Right. That's, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, there's an occasional root and rock. That's it. Um, and then I went to Q as I was going to QMT, uh, you know, some of my friends who had done it were like Quebec mega trail. Yeah. Quebec mega trail. You know, it's, at, it's like the Adirondacks, right. Right. So it's like that East coast, like technical, um, really rocky, mm. you know, you, you come across ropes in the course to get up rocks and stuff. And, um, I had, I had friends who had, who were familiar with the trails or had done races and they would, they were texting me like, you have no clue what you're getting yourself into. Right. And I was like, Oh really? And then, then I started like looking at the trail on YouTube. I'm like, Oh God, I'm like, I really don't. And then I went to the course. So like I, we went down to, we went up to Quebec a week before the race and I, I hit up the, the most technical section. And, you know, of course I wasn't hard, running hard. It was the week before, but I was just kind of going along and I'm running like twice as slow as what I would like, what I would run on a flat trail. It was, I was, I, I blew my mind. So, um, so yeah, back to the, back to the answer is like, you know, you look at, you know, uh, like a course record or something and you're like 50 K and it's whatever, like the course records, like you know, three and a half hours, yeah. you know, four hours. It's like, yeah. Oh, it must be super easy to run, <laughs> you know, whatever pace per mile that is, you know, or like, you know, Oh, to run like, you know, four twenty per K for 50 K like that's a walk in the park, but like not on those trails, you know? So I don't know. I think a lot of people just don't know. And, and, and I thought I kind of knew and I didn't know. Are you getting any feedback from former training partners and competitors about your, your movement into the scene? And are any of those folks that you've trained with in the past, are they also getting curious? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, I think some of my friends realize how much fun I'm having with it and just changing it up, like is fun and um as motivating as marathon marathoning was for many years um it, it you know if i was it's just so calculated for me now you know i'd be going out i do very similar workouts i was always trying to change things up but it really wasn't much different and now it's like i'm learning a whole new skill set and it it's you know and it's it's there's just so much more unknown right i'm, I'm curious about a lot more so I, and, and my, some of my friends can, can tell that. And they're like, yeah, they're, they're totally like, get it. Like, wow. Like, uh, like the, I know some people are going to, you know, go out to QMT and, and try a race for, for the first time. Um, and then, yeah, as far as meeting new people, like I feel everyone I've met in, in the trail running ultra world has just like been like, like really supportive and really nice. Um, I'm lucky. Uh, I've known Rob Carr for a long time where he's also from Hamilton. Yeah. Um, and so when I, before black Canyons, I was black Canyon, I was staying with Rob and Flagstaff and picking his brain um, uh, about Western States and, and, uh, and other stuff. And, um, and, and his buddy Buck um, volunteered to crew. I wasn't going to have a crew at black Canyon. 
And Buck's like, he's like, you he's like, you're going to be running. If you're running with the, you know, with the pack and you come into the first aid station, you're not going to want to give up a minute and a half because you got to go look at your drop bag. I'm like, yeah, that's true. So it's just, yeah, just stuff like that. Like he, he, he drove down from flag and, um, you know, help me, help me get through the, the aid stations. Um, yeah, just, just a ton of examples like that where people are ready to offer advice. And, um, so many times people are like, well, I haven't, you know, I haven't gone to the Olympics, but you know, if I can, I'm like, but I'm like, it's completely different. Like, give me any advice. Like I'll take it from, from anybody on the, on the trails and, you know, whether, whether, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it, you know, it's good advice or not. I still want to kind of hear it. You know, if you're putting on your ambassador hat just for a second, what do you think it's going to take to recruit more road and track people, men and women of your caliber into the sport? What do you think some of the good selling points are? You mentioned fun, which is interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's not going to be for everybody. Cause I don't know, like if, if someone's got a big ego, they're not going to want to come to a very similar sport and get their butt kicked. Right. Like, you know, if they see me go to black Canyon and not, and drop out of the race and they're not as fast as me on the roads, they're probably like, I'm not going to go there and get beat by, you know, some guys who, you know, have, can't break like whatever, like whatever time and a half marathon or something. Um, so you kind of have to let your ego go and just have fun with it. Um, which is good. Cause I think it will, I think the people that do come to trail ultra will be, you know, very positive and not as serious. Um, I, I, I mean, re- reality, I, I would say like, um, road runners are very like, I, I, I can't remember the last time I paid for a, a race entry, you know, and now it's like I'm paying for race entries and, um, then they're way more expensive than I ever remember. Um, like, yeah, you know, I paid, I paid for QMT and I was like, I'm like, I'm like, what, like, this is like over, I forget what it was like 200, like black can, I think it was like $300 or something, you know? So knowing that if I stayed on the roads, I would be getting free entries and, and often an appearance fee, just the startup to, to enter, there's that barrier um, of like, you know, if you, of course, if you become really good at trail running, then, then there's a contract for you. So I got lucky. Um, uh, I picked up by Solomon this year. Um, and I really wasn't expecting much. I was like, Hey, if I get shoes, that's great. Cause I really liked their, I was already running in their shoes and, um, and then they, you know, they, they've offered to help with some travel and stuff. And I was like, wow, this is, that's great. Um, so, uh, I think, yeah, if you get really good, the money's there, but mm-hmm. when you first look over from the roads, it, it looks pretty dismal, especially, I mean, if you look at prize money, right? Like, like there's very few events that offer prize money yeah. um, versus the roads. Every single race has prize money. Well, maybe this is a good place to ask this question. You mentioned like prize money, for example, what are some of the other big differences for aspiring pro athletes on the roads versus the trail? Like are the conversations you have with potential sponsors now being a trail athlete, are they very different from the ones you used to have when you were on the road? Well, I think, I think trail running is on the up and up. Um, so my, my, my deal with new balance when I was at my peak was, I I thought was great. You know, it it wasn't, it it wasn't big by any means, but, um, in in the, in the, in the last few years, you know, it just, it just kind of got cut. I wasn't performing at the same level. Yeah. So when I was moving to the trails, I was kind of just, I was like, well, I kind of know my value as a road runner. So I, I didn't even bother asking for any sort of stipend. Um, and I, I, I think, it seems as though like some companies are, are more excited right now about trail running than, than road running. Um, maybe just cause it's, you know, it's got the momentum and it, it, it's growing and road running has been very similar for so many years, but um, yeah, I, I mean, of course I, you know, I only, I only talked to a few companies, but they were um, they were all, they're all pretty excited. I, I think too, knowing that, my, my fault, my social following, you know, is mostly road runners. So I kind of offered something different. Um, you know, when, when I was, you know, if I would, I, I, um, you know, Speedland gave me shoes last year and, you know, most of my 
following probably never heard of them. And most of my followers probably, I'm going to guess I've never run in Solomon shoes because they're not really a road shoe. Um, they're, they're making some, they're making some really good shoes this year. I'm like really excited to try, but just in the past, it's, it's very much a trail company. So it kind of expands their, their viewership. So that's kind of what I had to offer versus somebody who's been doing trail running for a bunch of years. I want to come back to our conversation about training and how you are sort of a student of the sport. You've only recently made the switch, but with the experience you've had in trail and ultra so far, are there any things you've determined you need to change up in your training or race approach to achieve similar success? Oh yeah. And and it's honestly changing like every month. And my plan was after black Canyon was to focus on like just pure like running fitness um like road fitness to the end of march and run a 30k yeah and then have that fitness um roll into very specific trail running for april and may and june and i think that's probably a good plan for a seasoned trail runner um but after running black canyon i realized i i don't see fitness holding me back at western states Mm -hmm. i see I see the downhills destroying my legs and it wouldn't even matter how fit I am if I can't run <laughs> kind of thing. So now I've changed that to, um, I gotta get, I just, I mean, I just gotta get tougher legs. I, I need to get trail. I need, I like that. And that's, a, that's obviously a huge difference between a marathoner and, um, and, and some people would have it naturally, right? Like some people would naturally fall into trail running, um, you know, naturally handle downhills better yeah. and, some people probably have the proprioception and agility to, to do downhills. And I I'd like to think that with my skiing and skateboarding background that um, I would adapt <laughs> quicker than I have, but maybe I could, I haven't really done those activities for a long time. Um, it's, it's been a real challenge for me. Um, so yeah, I've, yeah, I'm, I'm really like, I'm really now more focused on just being able to, have my body get through that. And then I think with the training that I end up, all the running I end up doing, um, I'll, I know, I, I know I can get fit enough, um, to, to be, to be competitive, but I don't, I don't, I still don't know if I can be uh, durable enough. We'll see. One of the interesting thing you said earlier, you, you talked about the homogeneity of training and ultras, which is, which is interesting. And I do, I think, I do think I agree to some extent because, the coaching profession in our sport is only about a decade old. I, I listened to the uh, Jason Coop's podcast. He's a pretty well-known coach in our sport. And I, I want to say he tells this story sometime around 2010, where he basically had to not beg, but like really sell athletes in our sport on the value of coaching. And I think he even offered his services for free to some of the top athletes in the sport. And they were like, no, I'm just going to go log a bunch of miles. So, um, yeah, given that you also have a coaching background and you know the X's and O's really well, what um, what's interesting to you there, and what do you think will will change over time? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, like, I, I think with ultra, you can really come at it in, in in different ways, right? So, whereas most mostly in marathon, people are coming from a similar in, in a similar way. Um, even talking to Rob Carr, he was his training when he was winning Western States in 2014 and 2015 was much different than when he won lead bill in 2018. Um, which, which I find like very different. Whereas, you know, I used to think my training in 2012, uh, you know, or I say my training in 2011 when I ran 210 versus my training in 2016 when I ran 210 was very different. But now when I think of what different is in ultra, I'm like, Oh no, like, it was pretty much the same, like my training for the marathon. So yeah, like some people can, yeah. And you can do that. Like you said, like when in 2010, 2011, maybe the ultra culture was just go out and log miles and not worry about repeats and intervals and stuff like that. And, and you could, you, I think people can have success with that. Um, and, and some people can have success, you know, doing VO two max intervals every once in a while, you know, like you're like to, to, to focus on kind of like that 10 to 13 minute, um, you know, physiology and, and, and take that to a 14 to 21 hour race seems ridiculous, but there, there is like, there is some benefit to that. 
Um, yeah, so I, I, I think I think coaching in ultra is is important for certain athletes. I think some athletes know their body so well that they're they're probably better off without a coach. And then others will leave it up to them. And you see this across all runners is that you know oh 90 miles a week I, I, I achieved a certain level of success. Now 100 miles a week I'm a bit better. 110 now I'm even a bit better. And they just keep on adding and adding. It's just, it just doesn't work at some point. It just doesn't work anymore, you know, and then they crash. And sometimes you need a coach to say, you know, like, like, let's, let's hold up here. Like this, this is a good, this is a good volume of training or intensity of training. Like more is not always better. What's sustainable in the long run. So there's, yeah, for so many reasons, coaches can, can be beneficial, whether you're doing VO2 max workouts or running 20 hours a week. I love this conversation and I, I think it'll be an ongoing one because uh, two episodes ago, we had a guy named Jeff Colt on the show and he offered one of the hottest takes yet to date, which is that he doesn't believe in coaching whatsoever. And this show is suffering figurative second and third degree burns from that take. Uh, <laughs> we've had more comments post episode uh, than any other. So it's just interesting. We're still in that like time frame where it's still like a new thing. And, um, like there's not a ton of re research in academia around a lot of the major principles on what works and what doesn't. And there's a lot of testing and there's a lot of variations. I mean, you just mentioned Rob Carr being on a bike for the majority of the time pre Leadville. And I want to say like Anton Krupichka did the same thing this past year uh, before Leadville as well. So interesting. Yeah. It's maybe similar to uh, what triathlon was like between 2000, 2010. I don't know a ton of great comparison. I don't know a ton about triathlon training, but I was friends with a bunch of triathletes and um, the coaching uh, principles and theories really varied between coach to coach because it was kind of the wild, wild west back then, right? Like mm. it just became an Olympic sport in 2000 and really professionalized and, and yeah, co coaches were coming at it from very different angles. Um, uh, I don't know where it is now, but I, I, I'm guessing that it, it the, the, the philosophies and theories don't vary as much as they did 20 years ago. I don't either, but that's a great comparison. I had never, I think it's helpful to think about timelines in our sport compared to triathlon, for example. Yeah. 20, 2000 to 2010. Maybe we can talk about the rest of your 2022 schedule here. I'm curious, you had a ton of success at Quebec Megatrail. I'm pretty sure you won the race there. And then you just had a DNF at Black Canyon. And the reason I, I, I draw that contrast is because I think that the sky's the limit for you in the sport. Like you, you just mentioned Western States in June. I think that you could win that thing. Um, but like, I always get scared, especially when DNFs happen early, because I always wonder like, does it motivate you or does it deflate you? Um, like, are you still encouraged to keep going in the sport and to double down and invest? Or are you just like, I'm going to go back to the road. So <laughs> what, what are like your initial feelings post black Canyon? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because during the race, I was feeling a bit deflated. Um, uh, I think, I mean, one, I mean, first, first, first of all, I, I just wasn't physically prepared for it. Um, so like, that's not really an excuse. That's just, you know, you're not fast enough. It's just plain and simple. Um, I, but I did make some mistakes on the day. So I honestly thought my legs would be good through 70 K. Um, and I thought the heat was going to hit me first. So I was like, okay, like start hydrating a ton it's going to get hot after three hours, you know, at 7.00 AM it was, it was beautiful. Um, even, by, even at 9.00 AM, I think it was still like, whoa, what a great day. But, um, I don't know. It wasn't like my watch enough, but I'm, I'm sure somewhere after three or four hours, uh, it was getting hot, but I was still doing really well. And I, I was convinced the heat was going to be, I was going to start dealing with heat, um, and, you know, cooling down and maybe slowing down my pace to, you know, to, to make it sustainable because of that. But, um, I actually was feeling really good. And, and then it was my legs after there was a pretty steep downhill. I was running with, uh, Adrian McDonald yeah. and Anthony Castalis, probably approaching 50 K something like that, 45. Um, and, and Anthony just, it was like the switchbacks and he just took off and I, I could not keep up with him. And, and then I kind of looked back on one of the switchbacks and Adrian was even further back. I'm like, okay, so 
I'm not running. I can't be running that slow, right? Like <laughs> I'm pulling away from him, but it felt like it just, just how fast Anthony moved away from me. Right. Um, and then there was another long downhill and that's when like Scott Trayer caught me and yeah. a couple other guys. And that's that, that downhill like really did my legs in. And then I lost, yeah, like Justin Grunewald was there and I, I kind of lost, lost um, contact with a bunch of these guys. And there was a steep incline right before the 50 K um, aid station. It wasn't a crude one. Okay. And then on that, on that steep uphill, I caught up to everyone again. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm like, I still, I'm like, I'm st- like, I st- my energy levels feel fine. My legs feel good going uphill. And then it wasn't long after that. It just, it just fell apart so fast for me. And so mentally I wasn't re- I wasn't ready. And I always tell my athletes, if you're not ready to hurt, you not that, that you're not going to deal with it that well. Um, so that was a mistake. That's a I great made. quote. It's like, I'm like, you know, I, I should have been ready to hurt at any point. And I think feeling as good as I did at 40 K I became overconfident that I was going to cruise the next 30 K um, given how I felt at QMT and then at Grand Raid Mascovain, um, even later on in the race, when there was runnable parts, I couldn't run that fast and I knew my legs were dead. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I kind of anticipated I would, my legs would, would kind of crap out. I just didn't know that would happen that early. And being at a training run for me, so I got really lucky. Um, I was I was going to do a, this. I was trying to do this FKT in September. It was like a 73k loop in northern Ontario, driving out with my buddy, and um, uh, his good friend. He was on a television show called Boundless. Rory Bozio was actually on the third season as well. Um, but uh, they um, he owns this uh, Simon. My, my, my buddy, Paul, his buddy, Simon, um, they're on the television show, owns this uh, company called Stoked Oats. They, you know, they make oatmeal and granola yeah. and stuff in Canada. And Paul told Simon's like, oh yeah, I'm driving Reed up. We're going to do uh, this, this La Cloche route. And Reed's, Reed's going to try to get to Western States next year, like run these uh, golden ticket races. So I, that's why I was signed up for Black Canyon. And Simon's like, we're trying to sponsor um, Western States next year. And if so, we'll have a, an athlete sponsored athlete spot does he want it i'm like yeah of course i do (laughs) um so it was like this amazing opportunity that was just presented to me um and and so when i looked at black canyon on the calendar calendar i thought hey it's a net downhill race i'm going to experience heat um you know similar terrain in in the big context when i compare the other two ultras I did last year, uh, which were very um, technical. Yeah. So I, 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 just, I was like, wow, well, like I, I should still do it as a training run. So this mentality that when I got to 50 K 60 K and I'm like, it's still a good training run. <laughs> so when I, when I got to 80 K, I was just, I was like 80 K that's a great training run. And I, at that point I, I saw Jared Hazen um, going to a car. And I'm like, well, if he can, if he can do it, I can do it. So I just, <laughs> that was one of the, I had a few reasons to drop out. Um, my toe being really sore and not having a headlamp where a couple other ones, but yeah, I pulled the plug. Um, and as deflated as that was in the, in the, in the moment, like I, I'm glad I learned some of the lessons I did then, uh, um, ahead of Western States, you know, had it been two months before there just, there for sure wouldn't have been enough time. I still don't know if there'll be enough time, but I think there's a chance. Um, so uh, I'm way more motivated to, to kind of like fine tune my training. Um, I'm talking to a few people about, you know, what, like, I don't have a coach, but I do do talk to some um, people like this guy, Glenn Redpath is a Canadian. He's got three top 10 finishes at Western States. Um, he, he's been a big help and Rob Carr and, um, and yeah, and just, it just kind of seeking out, like, I'm like, okay, is this a stupid idea or a good idea in my training? And they'll, you know, they'll kind of tell me. And um, so, yeah, super, I'm just, I, I've actually reached out to a couple more people and um, super motivated. Given that our sport isn't in the Olympics yet, I've always thought it'd be kind of cool if governments took interest in these otherwise marquee races like utmb in western states and like in the same way that you got stipends to go train for the olympics they could just be like hey we're going to call this the win western states project and you're going to bring a podium finish back to canada 
That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> it would be cool. And there, I think you'd have to represent Canada. And, and, you know, like I'm representing like, you know, Solomon, CLA, Stoke Dotes and blah, blah, blah endurance tap. But um, the, the, the one good thing, well, there'd be maybe a bunch of good things, but the one thing I would like to see in the sport is be, like better drug testing yeah. and having countries involved is really how that tends that that's when it follows. Right. Like you see other professional sports, like, like NFL, like why do they care to police themselves? Like, <laughs> you know, like Actually, versus like others, like the Olympic sports is like, okay, like we don't trust this country. So we need, we need drug testing. <laughs> I'm trying to think of, and again, I'm thinking of this off the cuff right now. So I'm trying to think of how to phrase it, but could you paint a picture of what drug testing looked like for you as an athlete, like post post, like post an Olympic event or post Boston marathon versus like the absence of it. Like I'm guessing when you crossed the finish line at Quebec mega trail, for example, you were like probably expecting on some, some level to like do something for that because you'd done it at other marathon events, but it just doesn't exist there. So like, what would it look like if we had like real drug testing in place in our sport? Well, real drug testing, honestly, isn't, isn't really post event. Um, okay. Okay. I mean, if you, if, if you don't have it at all post event, then it's like, you can do anything. You can go back to what the cyclists were doing in the eighties and take amphetamines. Right. Which is like, no one would ever do that in running anymore. Cause it's just like so easy to get caught. Right sorry, like in marathoning and in road running stuff, like, because there are, there are random drug tests after races. Um, yeah. Like most races you're going to get, if you finish on the podium, you're going to get drug tested, but drug testing really takes place, um, throughout the year. So from 2005 until last November, I was part of the, um, so I, I, I still am actually in the registered dr uh, drug testing pool. Okay. Um, so I could get drug tested at any time at my house, but I'm not a part of the whereabouts program, which I was a part of for 15 plus years, um, where you have to say where you're going to be every single day. And you have to have a one hour time slot where you're guaranteed to be at that place. And if the drug testers show up on that one hour slot and you're not there, you get like a strike and, and three strikes and you get a, um, Three strikes within, I th they changed it. It was 18 month, but then they changed it, I think, to 12 month period. You, you, you basically are, you get, um, a, like, you know, you're, yeah, you're basically getting caught um, yeah. and you have to serve a suspension. And most, most years I would get tested anywhere from like three to six times uh, at my house and they would take urine and blood. So then they have all your blood parameters and that's how they're catching endurance athletes is it's like, it's like, they don't catch, they don't catch people with EPO in their system, but they realize that their blood is, is, you know, like their red blood cell count is way higher than it was at some other point, And that cannot possibly happen with just altitude training or, or training. And so that, that that's how the, the majority of, of runners are getting caught in the mm -hmm. past. So I think they implemented this in 2011 and really like, from like probably like 2013 on like, it's, it, it was, it, it seemed, it seemed pretty effective, um, as far as, um, and then, yeah, of course, yeah. Before races, after races, I get tested a bunch more times. And the convenient part was that I never had to go get my blood checked like myself. I was like, you know, I'd have like yeah. eight blood tests a year where I can just go look for free. At, like at, they come to my house and I can check up online my ferritin levels afterwards. So, <laughs> so it wasn't all bad. Forget about this inside tracker sponsorship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, um, yeah, it, 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 in a way it was convenient. And of course I was always happy to like, um, you know, do my part um, in, in, in keeping uh, sport clean. Last question here before, before we, um, before we go to the lightning round, what are, I'm curious, what are some things that you plan to do in training and just in lifestyle in general to close that, uh, preparation gap for Western States? Uh, yeah, training. I'm going to, I'm going to start doing, um, a bit more downhill running. Um, you know, of course you have to be careful with that. Um, I don't, I'm not trying to get injured here, but uh, it, it is, it is my weakness. So even, even a month ago, I was like, if I had to work on, I'm like, 
I'm like, okay, uphill is where I'm going to gain fitness. And I'm, um, I, I know fitness will come. So yeah, downhill, downhill running, toughen the legs up. Um, a few more exercises, like, like a bit more weight stuff, kind mm. of get more consistent with that. I, I know what to do. Um, I don't like lifting weights, but, um, <laughs> I know what to do and what I should do. Um, and, and, and just some more, um, some more back-to-back long runs. Um, and I, I haven't really done that, that, that many of them at all. I've maybe only done it. Like I never did it obviously like marathoning, but even since I started training for ultras last July, I don't know, maybe I've, maybe I've done it two or three times. <laughs> and, uh, and when I did it, I, I did like the responses it elicited and it, it did, it did seem beneficial. So, um, yeah, these back-to-back long runs, um, and, and, and just hitting trails too, which I would have done more of, but just with the snow on the trails, um, it, it's just, it just wasn't possible. So some stuff I know what to do. Other stuff is going to be a bit newer. Lightning round here. First question. We might've already covered part of this question earlier in the, in the show, but I'll ask it again. Is there anything you used to believe strongly earlier in your career that you have since changed your mind about as the years have gone on? Oh, it's such a good question. And I, I don't feel like I have a good answer. Um, I mean, it was very, very early in my career. Um, I, I kind of like maybe put more limits on myself okay. um, and um, was a bit more narrow minded on, on what I should be doing with training um, and then that changed through my track and marathon career. And now in the last bunch of months, it's completely exploded open, um, for, <laughs> for different things that can be beneficial to me. It's amazing too. You talked about limits there. Um, I think that the most interesting stat from black Canyon was that the top two finishers were over 40 years old and they ran the third fast third and fourth fastest times ever on the course. So everything that I assumed about ultra running and about professionalization and about where our sports headed, it kind of got a little bit blown up in that race because you can be an older runner as well and still achieve a ton of success and be close to the top of the sport. Yeah. Yeah. Very, and, w- and what I've noticed too, is my, in the past five years, I, I, my leg speed has just, you know, like I have no, no ambitions of running a four minute mile anymore. Um, but my, my comfort level at running say three thirty per K when I'm fit doesn't really seem that different, um, than it did in my prime. So to, yeah, to hold on, to hold on to endurance, um, as you age is, you know, being healthy, of course, is like paramount to that, but, and, and consistency, but you don't lose as much aerobic function as you do power, um, which can, can bode well for longer distances. What's a recent book, movie, or podcast you've consumed that has left a big impression on you or changed the way you think or see the world? Yeah, of course. Like a lot of, well, your, your podcast of, um, what I came across it when, uh, I wanted to know about Dave or learn about Dave Stevens. Yeah. When my buddy was like, Hey, my buddy just won (laughs) one run rabbit run. I'm like, yeah, I saw that name. I didn't know he was Canadian, but yeah, your podcast and Dylan Bowman's podcast, Mm. um, yeah. And a coop cast I've listened to as well. This is great. Yeah. Um, I still listen to uh, AM shakeout and then there's a Canadian shakeout podcast. So uh, th- those are, those are like kind of my go-to um, uh, my, my go-to for like, just go and even like, I mean, your podcast isn't that long, so you can't go back in the archives to like 2018 <laughs> or anything, but you know, going back and just listening to, like, like I use the example that Magda Boulay was just, it was really cool to hear about her transition to yeah. from road to ultra. Um, a, a, I think as far as a running book last year, um, the one that stuck out to me the most was probably Dina Castor's uh, let your mind run, okay. let your mind run. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed that. I, I, I took a lot from that and just such a cool story of just, she just wanted to make it happen. And like just the, the chances that she took, um, to, to get to where she ended up uh, getting was, 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 was unbelievable. So that was really inspiring. And I learned a lot from D 
Dina Castor's book. Random side note. I was just talking about this with a friend on a run this morning. Canadian running magazine is pretty, pretty good. Like it is, I, get, it is. I get a lot of news from that, like independent of, of Canada. Like there's great stuff there. Yeah. And they, 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 they push out a lot of articles too. Like they're, they're on it. Last question. If you could put a message on a billboard for all to see, what would it say and why? Um, die with memories, not dreams. So I didn't come up with that, <laughs> obviously. Um, but it was just, it, it was, a, it's a quote that I think is pretty cool. Just, it basically just reminds people that you got a dream, like make it a memory, like go and do it. Right. Um, kind of like seize the moment. Man, that is the perfect place to put a pin. This has been awesome. I have really, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I feel like we have a ton of threads we could have kept going on. So if you ever want to come back on the podcast again, you're more than welcome. And I can't wait to follow you at Western States. Um, if folks want to follow the journey, where can they follow you on social? And then I also understand that you coach. So um, maybe we can plug your coaching business as well. Yeah. So social, it's really easy. Um, if you know how to spell my name, R-E-I-D-C-O-O-L-S-A-E-T, read cool set, uh, at Twitter, um, Instagram. And I did write a blog about Black Canyon, but I hadn't wrote, <laughs> I hadn't written a blog for two years. Um, uh, and um, yeah, my coaching business is Cool Set Go, um, uh, and I it, it it it's gone really well. So it's a good problem to have, but um, totally filled up uh, my capacity for coaching last year. But two of my friends um, who are capable coaches, Jordan Birma. Um, and Chris Duchesne um, are still taking on some athletes. Um, and uh, yeah, they have a lot of, a lot of good experience. Awesome. Well, can't wait to chat again. And until then, best of luck in training. Thanks a lot, Finn. Yeah. Had a, had a, had a blast uh, chatting with you.